No? Okay, so uh, so today I will uh, uh, like to discuss some uh, connection between uh, the computations sort of in the standard uh, inflationary of, of standard inflationary perturbation theory with some ideas of uh, Hartland Hawking for the wave function of the universe. And I'd like to present it as a kind of puzzle. Uh, so I'll try to explain what that is. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to remind you of uh, something we said a, a few lectures ago, uh, which is that um, we are going to take this perspective of the uh, wave function. So we have a wave for a scalar field. We could imagine a wave functional of the field. Um, and so we are in the sitter and uh, we can calculate the wave functional as a function of the field in the far future. So this is uh, eta equal to zero. This is the far past, eta equal to minus infinity. And this is x. So here we have some uh, phi of x, which is uh, something defined on a late time slice. So it's a function of three variables, not a function of time. So only of uh, three of the variables, a function of x. So we have this function of x, uh, and we can uh, evaluate uh, this wave functional. And we can evaluate it by in, in many different ways. We can calculate the Schrodinger uh, wave function and evolve it all the way here. We can calculate expectation values and deduce what the wave functional is. So we have uh, various ways. In particular, we discussed uh, one way to compute it, um, which was uh, doing the path integral and in the classical approximation, so the leading three-level approximation, this wave functional is just simply given by the classical action. Okay, so this is the classical action on a now four-dimensional solution. So this is a classical solution, uh, which is now a function of eta and x, uh, which at the boundary is equal to this original phi x. So let me call this phi not of x. Um, so phi classical um, at uh, eta, let's say, equal to zero and x is equal to phi naught of x, okay? So we are given this, we are supposed to calculate uh, this solution, and uh, we impose that this solution, uh, so phi classical goes to zero, as eta goes to minus infinity, uh, plus i epsilon times infinity. Remember this story? So we shift the contour a bit in the complex direction. So we put these boundary conditions, we find the classical solution, we get, uh, we get that, okay? Now, um, this uh, can be done for, uh, well, this we discussed it in the context of quantum fields in a fixed de Sitter background, but we can also do it in the context of gravity. And in the context of gravity, then uh, we would fix uh, the three-dimensional metric. Uh, so this is a three metric. And also this uh, phi naught, let's say if we have an inflaton field, we fit phi, phi naught of x, so we give these two functions. And um, so these are uh, data that we give on these slides. They tell us, uh, you know, the geometry, the intrinsic geometry of these slides. So we fix the intrinsic geometry of the three-dimensional slides um, and, uh, and phi. And then we calculate uh, this uh, wave functional of uh, these variables, okay? And uh, in canonical uh, general relativity, we can think of uh, the wave function, uh, wave functional in terms of uh, these three variables, and it will obey some constraints. So it will uh, obey a reparameterization constraint and a Hamiltonian constraint and so on. And from that, uh, we could in principle uh, recover all the physics of uh, our space time. Um, so, in the context of, of, of inflation, uh, evaluating this wave function at late time uh, corresponds to evaluating this uh, for three metrics, which are very big. So we have very big three metrics. We evaluate uh, the wave function there. That's uh, equivalent to going to late times. And um, the solution is given by the, the, this in the leading approximation, classical approximation, or three-level diagrams. Uh, this is given by, again, the um, some action of a four-dimensional solution, some classical, so this is a four-dimensional metric. And again, this is a, a four-dimensional, uh, well, a, a scalar field defined in four dimensions. 
uh, with the boundary conditions, uh, well, similar to the boundary conditions we had here, this condition for the, for the scalar, and then for the metric, we will impose the condition that uh, the metric at, uh, so we have a four-dimensional space uh, with some boundary, um, and uh, on this boundary, the, the four-dimensional metric restricted to this boundary agrees with this uh, three-dimensional metric. Okay, so that's, uh, what the, those are the boundary conditions we impose at uh, the future. And in the past, we, uh, we impose uh, the condition that if we suitably analytically continue this to Euclidean time, right? So some condition somewhat uh, similar to the one that I think I erased here. So, um, so this is a condition in some fixed coordinate system but uh, we can kind of imagine generalizing this by saying that we uh, continue that space-time, which is Lorentzian, we continue it to Euclidean space-time, and we demand that the, the solution is not singular in that Euclidean space-time, okay? Now, this in principle is uh, defined for small perturbations around the sitter, and if we do that, we get uh, exactly the same answers that we got before if we expand this action to quadratic order, so if we expand all of this to quadratic order around the flat, around flat space, then, oh, sorry, around the sitter, or, or around the, more precisely, around the inflationary universe, which is, uh, fl it has flat spatial slices, but it's independent, um, then we'll get exactly the same answers we had before, okay? Um, very good. So now uh, we could consider also uh, space times, which, uh, have some interesting global structure. So for example, uh, we could imagine a space-time which, uh, you know, is a s some deformed sphere far away, right? Uh, um, a long distance that closes off into a sphere, for example. And maybe it's a deformed sphere, maybe it's a round sphere. So we could consider the case of the round sphere, for example. Um, and if we apply this first, let's say apply this first to the round sphere. So if we apply uh, this prescription to the round sphere, what we would find is that, so we have a very big round sphere in the far future, then uh, we evolve in Lorentzian time until the sphere has some size equal to the, let's say, the Sitter cosmological constant. Let's say we have a sphere, let's say for the sake of the argument, let's imagine we don't have the scalar field now, then we'll introduce the scalar field in a second. Um, so if we don't have the scalar field, then uh, we have uh, here a solution of Einstein's equations which fix cosmological constant. And here uh, we go all the way to the place where this size is of order h minus one, uh, and then we join to Euclidean space, right? The geometry we discussed before. And if we do this and we evaluate uh, that action, uh, we find in this particular case that e to the i s uh, is equal to e to the uh, the entropy of the sitter. Okay, so or this is also equal proportional to well with factors of four pi, etc. Uh, to um, m Planck to the fourth over uh, v, for example. Uh, v is the potential or the cosmological constant. Um, so that's, um, well, let me put lambda here. Um, okay, so that's, uh, the, uh, that's the, the expression that we get. Um, um, ah, sorry, I made a mistake. So it's, it's this over two, okay? So it's the, the Sitter entropy over two. Uh, and then if we, so this could be viewed as the wave function, and the wave function square is what uh, gives e to the entropy of the sitter, okay? And the entropy of the sitter, so let me just be more precise. Um, so let me put that with all the factors so that you see it's a concrete expression. So the entropy of the sitter is equal to the area of the de sitter horizon over four pi, okay? So not for pi, for G Newton. Um, now this is the area of the De Sitter horizon for a, a, an observer. So let's say we have an observer that uh, sits here. So that observer will only see, let's say, half of uh, half of the space, and in particular, there will be a horizon which uh, will uh, be the maximal s two within this s three. Okay, the s three of the spatial directions. Uh, or in other words, in the Penrose diagram uh, for global de Sitter space, uh, we have 
the observer here sitting in the North Pole. Uh, and then we have these uh, null surfaces. Um, and this point here, well, actually, all these points uh, here are uh, two dimensional sphere uh, with uh, some size, uh, which is given by the Zeta radius. So this is a two dimensional sphere with uh, area 4 pi times the radius of the Zeta squared. And this is equal to h to the minus 2. Okay? So that's uh, the formula for the, the Zeta entropy. Um, very good. So this is a generalization of the formula for the entropy of black hole horizons, for example. Um, now, um, um, yeah, so psi is the wave function, and psi square is supposed to be some kind of probability. There is a question of the interpretation. Yes, that's, uh, that's right. So. Um, yeah, so if you, if you were in a single de Sitter space, uh, you would say, well, this is just some overall normalization of the wave function, and we just divide by that normalization. Um, so here, the idea is that you could be considering probabilities of creating, let's say, the Sitter spaces of different cosmological constants, and then that presumably will give you the probability of creating it with uh, different values of cosmological constant. We'll discuss, uh, that will become a little more clear in a second, that I'll discuss very possibilities with various cosmological constants. Yeah, this, at this point, uh, it's not obvious how we should interpret it. It's bigger than one, so uh, it doesn't, uh, as, as you say, it doesn't make sense as a probability. Um, but we're imagining there is, perhaps we need to divide this by something that makes it normalized. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, this is just, uh, for the moment, it's just a coincidence that uh, the action, so uh, this S and this S are two different things. Um, th they both uh, are conventionally called with the letter S. This S is the action, and this S uh, happens to be the entropy of the sitter, which is defined separately through this formula. So for uh, from the point of view of this the derivation, this just looks like a coincidence, okay? Um, It's, it's not so much a coincidence if you think about, uh, okay, so let, let me try to ex explain this coincidence. So if we uh, think about the static observer and we try to do gravitational thermodynamics, uh, then we would uh, compactify this in uh, Euclidean time, right? Um, and we could consider some kind of microcanonical ensemble where we let this we don't fix any particular period for the Euclidean time. Um, and so then we'll get a Euclidean solution, which uh, where this circle has some size uh, at uh, r equal to zero. So this is r equal to zero here. And then at uh, the horizon, let's say rh, uh, that circle shrinks to zero size, right? Uh, there is also an S2. Uh, the S2 of the horizon has some size here and then uh, shrinks to zero at r equal to zero, right? That's where the position is. And uh, so this circle S1 together with this sphere S2 uh, for, and this whole structure form the uh, sphere S4, okay? So that's the geometry of this. The partition function of uh, this quantity, so set, um, is a partition function in a microcanonical um, ensemble where we are not uh, fixing the energy versus summing over everything. Uh, and the size of this circle is fixed by demanding that here we have no singularity and it happens to be 2 pi r where r is the radius of the sitter. Okay. Um, so if we are thinking that we are computing a, um, this uh, ensemble, microcanonical ensemble, uh, the answer is just counting, is supposed to be identified with e to the s, right? E to the entropy. This would be like the gibbons hawking derivation, which is, it was in fact done by Gibbons and Hawking. Uh, so in the case of black holes, uh, this would give you the black hole entropy. In the case of black holes, we normally fix the actual value of the radius of the circle. We're computing it in the canonical ensemble, where we fix the temperature. Uh, here, we are doing it in the microcanonical ensemble, where we don't fix the temperature. Um, and so we, that this is what we expect. But this is also happens to be equal to E to the uh, minus the Euclidean action uh, of the S4, right, of the S4 manifold. 
And uh, this quantity is half of that because we, so this quantity, well, here I, um, yeah, well, this quantity has uh, two contributions. One uh, that is purely imaginary, okay, that comes from this region, the Lorentzian solution. So Lorentzian solutions will always be give you Im purely imaginary uh, contributions in the exponent. Um, and then a piece that is real that comes from half of the sphere. And since the whole sphere was given the entropy, so half of the sphere uh, would give you uh, half the entropy. Now, th there is some argument, some general argument for why, uh, why an action uh, which has a U1 symmetry, um, why gravitational action with a U1 symmetry receives contributions only from uh, the area. So, only from, yeah. um, so that's uh, roughly what we expect. Um, yeah, so here I, I oversimplified a little bit. There, there are here some uh, imaginary contributions. Um, uh, so there are some imaginary contributions. In particular, there are some imaginary contributions that come from, uh, that are time dependent and depend on where you put the cutoff here. Or more precisely, some imaginary contributions which uh, depend on uh, local functions of, yeah, let, let me write this bigger. Um, So in general, there will be some imaginary contributions, some numbers, uh, some local functions on this G3, um, plus some other number, uh, G3 times uh, the curvature of the three-dimensional metric, okay? And then uh, there will be a finite piece, which is this uh, real number, okay? Um, now, this, uh, these functions here should be here because uh, the, remember that, um, the canonical momenta uh, corresponding to this metric are well are related to derivatives of the action with respect to the metric, right? So the canonical mom the momenta conjugate to g uh, are roughly uh, well they, they are in the quantum theory d d g so it correspond to derivatives with respect to of the action with respect to the metric, but we know that these classical solutions are such that uh, the universe is expanding. So pi, which is the extrinsic curvature, is uh, positive, it's non-zero, right? That's related to the expansion of the universe. So in the classical limit, pi is just simply related to the time derivative of uh, G, G3, okay? In, in, the four, in the full four-dimensional geometry. So since this is non-zero, we'd better have that this is non-zero. Um, so there is an I here, and that implies that uh, there should be a term like this. So that, that explains this first term. And this is just some uh, sub-leading correction to that. Um, okay, so that's why, but uh, if we are interested in calculating uh, something that looks more like a probability, uh, such terms are not important, okay? Uh, good, so that's uh, what we get from this. Um, and um, I, I, I wish to, uh, I want to emphasize that the, the calculation that gives us this answer is basically continuously connected to the calculation that gives us the answer that uh, for the small fluctuations, so we could have considered this geometry, and now we could consider small fluctuations in this uh, metric, right? So we now can change the problem slightly, we consider small fluctuations, um, and then uh, the metric now will not be uh, consist of a part that is purely uh, purely Lorentzian and purely Euclidean, it will be somewhat complex everywhere because uh, remember that uh, the solutions, so I in, this, in this region we can make the flat space approximation and remember that these solutions uh, had the form of uh, e to the i k eta, one minus i k eta, right? So they, they were only one uh, oscillating part, so they were really complex. So this is an example of uh, how um, we have these complexified geometries and that we require them to be smooth, right? So there will be, so in the leading approximation, we just have exactly this uh, geometry and we require that uh, things are non-singular here, right? So we, we add this perturbation and we demand that this perturbation is non-singular here at the tip. And that uh, will give us the same, essentially the same answer as what we had before. Um, okay, and this type of prescription is, uh, of, of going somehow into the Euclidean domain and demanding that the geometry is non-singular. Um, 
is analogous to the I epsilon prescription in uh, flat space, right? So it's analogous to what we uh, impose normally in flat space. And I, I would say that this is actually more fundamental than the I epsilon prescription in flat space in the sense that um, for the flat, so, so the, the state that we are in now, uh, let's say nearly flat space, we got it from cosmology. So we, we need we need a prescription like this in cosmology in order to get to flat space as we know it. Right? So, uh, and um, we don't know how to derive this condition from something more fundamental. So this is the most uh, fundamental derivation of this, or, the, or assumption, let's say, if you wish, uh, for cosmology, that that's, uh, that's how we are calculating things. Um, OK, very good. So now uh, let me discuss this for the context of inflation. So how would this change if uh, we do this calculation in the context of inflation? So um, let, me, let me first uh, consider the situation where we try to calculate this for a very big sphere. Okay? So we, have, we are considering a very big S3. Um, and then uh, we uh, fix the three metric here and uh, phi. So you can think of this as fixing the three metric and phi at some very late surface. Let's say it could be like the reheating surface or some value of phi where it's close to the end of inflation. Or, um, OK, so if we do that, then uh, we, we can imagine that we have a solution, which is basically the inflationary solution. So the Lorentzian inflationary solution, we can extrapolate it backwards. Uh, in time, and this whole thing is just the standard uh, inflationary trajectory uh, that, so if we uh, think, for example, V of phi, so we had uh, this cartoon for the potential, so we start, let's say phi here is close to the end of inflation, we could put it here or here, uh, so that's the phi at the end, and then uh, we'll, uh, as we go backwards here, uh, phi will start uh, going up as we go uh, backwards in time. Um, and then also the three sphere starts shrinking. And at some point, the three sphere will be of order of the local value of, of, of the local value of h at uh, that particular position, right? Um, and when that happens, uh, we could imagine that uh, we, uh, if we approximate that region simply by the sitter space, we can just put the, the sitter solution, okay? Uh, that would not quite be a Euclidean solution as we wanted because there is a scalar field that has, let's say, a non-zero derivative here. Uh, but the idea is that we uh, modify the form of the scalar field in this region in such a way that the time derivative of the scalar field here or the radial derivative of the scalar field here is zero, right? That might require for us to uh, move the scalar field a bit into a complex direction. So in fact, if uh, it had a non-zero time derivative in time, when we go to Euclidean space, we'll have a non-zero imaginary part, right? But the idea is that we can find, and you can, people have uh, numerically found, the solution that is uh, regular here, and it doesn't differ too much from the inflationary solution, because recall the, the derivatives were small. Um, where uh, the scalar field is smooth here, uh, it starts, uh, there is, you, you continue this a little bit into Euclidean time. Um, and then you get a completely uh, legal solution from the point of view of uh, this principle that we were enunciating. I'm calling this the Hartle-Hawking-like uh, wave function um, for the inflationary case. Okay, is that that more or less clear what the procedure is? Yeah. So the, the principle, what is the principle? So the principle is that we continue this to Euclidean space or to a complex geometry um, that should be smooth, right? It closes off in a smooth way. So in this case, we are considering a geometry which uh, depends only on time. It has uh, SO4 uh, symmetry. And we're going to continue to have this SO4 symmetry when we do this continuation. So the continuation only amounts to continuing in, uh, in the, the, the time direction. Um, and here the sphere shrinks to zero size. So it better be that the radial derivative at this point is zero for the scalar field, right? That, is that clear? Yeah. So if we put this boundary condition, uh, 
Then uh, we have some other boundary condition for the scalar field here that is, uh, you know, slowly rolling. And we then should find the solution with these boundary conditions. Um, and in general, we'll find some complex solution that obeys these boundary conditions that will be close to the slow roll solution. So this, th this, this thing of putting the hemisphere and demanding this condition is like uh, displacing the, uh, the, the feed a little bit from its slow roll solution, right? But since the slow roll solution is an attractor, so if we displace it somewhere uh, in this region, eventually in the future we'll go back to that attractor, okay? So that's uh, the logic, even if it had, let's say, some complex, uh, small complex part, it will uh, eventually go into the, this attractor. Uh, so the scalar field should be real and nice uh, here in the future. It might have some sub-leading uh, complex parts, but the leading part should be real. And, but here it could be complex in the, in the far past, so we don't have any restriction that of restricting it to be complex in the, in the far past. And in fact, even the, for the, that, that's not exotic, even for the small fluctuations, we had that they were complex when we think about them as solutions uh, of the classical action. Okay. Um, very good. So now uh, imagine, so we, we get this uh, solution, and now we are trying to evaluate uh, the wave function. Um, and then uh, what we get is uh, that that we'll get the, so th this part that is mainly Lorentzian will not contribute at all. And we'll have some contribution uh, from the Euclidean part, which will boil down essentially to the same as the De Sitter contribution to leading order. So the contribution will be simply e to the, uh, well, let's say, let's set M Planck to one. So e to the V of phi, uh, star, where phi star is the uh, value of phi, let's say phi star here, is the value of phi where the original three sphere that we had far, far here in the future uh, shrinks to be of order the Hubble size. So it's when that sphere, so that sphere, uh, and that big length scale of the sphere is outside the horizon in the far future, and it enters the horizon at this point. When it enters the horizon, um, that's uh, this phi star where we evaluate the potential, okay? So that's, uh, that's what we get. This, uh, the logic for this is very similar to the logic we use for the small fluctuations, okay? But we interpret this now as giving us the probability that we have that the universe uh, at long distances is a big sphere, right? So in the previous lectures we were saying, well, we imagine the universe is flat with some small perturbations, okay? But we didn't say exactly what the full uh, form of the universe is. But now we ask a different question. We say, well, uh, can we ask, uh, you know, what if the universe was a sphere? Can we calculate that probability? And through this method, you can calculate this probability and you get uh, some answer which is given by this formula. Okay? And before, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So we, he, here, here the idea is that here in the far future, we're in the slow roll inflating solution. Or we, we have a very big surface and uh, this is the type of solution for which we are, we have in the future and we are considering uh, how those close off in the past and so on. So it, it, it's, it's the same, basically the same logic that we used for uh, computing the small fluctuations. We are, we are in a, an inflating universe and then we have the small fluctuations and we, we demand that in the past we had a smooth state, and so, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so we got this answer, and uh, the, the problem is that this answer is, uh, it, it kind of makes the wrong prediction, so th let me try to explain why. Um, well, f first of all, uh, the universe, our universe at long distances is observed to be close to flat, so it's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't have positive curvature, okay? At least uh, not comparable with the size of our universe, okay? That's uh, observation number one. Uh, observation number two is that um, because you get this uh, factor, this factor uh, strongly prefers values of phi k, uh, values of phi star, uh, which uh, are as small as possible, okay? So we we'll want, uh, so if, if there was a way of making this smaller, that, that would be better. So 
In other words, uh, so here we fixed the value of this S3 and we got uh, some value of phi star, let me call this uh, some radius one. And let's imagine we fixed a smaller radius, let's say radius two, that is a smaller radius. So that will lead to some other inflationary solution uh, where we will close off uh, at an earlier time, right? So smaller sizes, remember, uh, were related to values of phi. So this is phi, phi star one, and this would be phi star two, okay? And so if we made uh, this smaller, um, then we would find that, uh, so, well, we have that V uh, phi two, phi, phi star two, uh, will be smaller than V of phi star one. And this implies that their inverses, of course, uh, have the opposite relation. And so we will strongly prefer uh, the smaller surface rather than the bigger surface, right? Um, and so how, how, how much would it prefer that? Well, we, we can, uh, so, uh, changing this by some, uh, let's say, order one factor, by some e-fold, um, is the same as uh, asking um, how this changes under, you know, a certain number of e-folds, right? And that's related to the derivative of the scalar and so on. And you can work it out, it's similar to the calculations we did uh, before to find, for example, the spectral index and so on, that involve factors of p. So it's exactly the same calculation, actually, it's essentially the same uh, calculation that we did for finding the spectral index of gravity waves that involve the factor of V. And if we do that, then we find that uh, adding or subtracting any fold um, gives a, a factor which is one over the amplitude of the, of the scalar fluctuations, amplitude of the scalar fluctuations uh, squared, okay? So the scalar fluctuation amplitudes were small, so this is a big factor of order uh, 10 to the 10, right? Um, and so it's preferring uh, smaller surfaces, okay? Um, but by a big factor, by a factor of 10 to the 10. So if we make it an e-fold smaller, it's 10 to the 10, e to the 10 to the 10 more probable. So it's uh, a huge pressure to make uh, the, this uh, big sphere, if it was there, smaller, okay? So, um, Okay, so what, what should we do with this? I think I view this as a wrong prediction. And uh, it's, uh, so let me, let me say it uh, in the following way. So we, standard cosmological perturbation theory gives you the correct prediction for something that agrees with uh, observations for, you know, small fluctuations and let's say angular momentum modes in the sky of order, curvature modes in the sky of order, uh, you know, L equal to two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, but for the L equal to zero curvature mode, you get something, it's a completely wrong prediction, okay? Um, now, what, what should we make out of this? So, uh, out of this. So, there are various answers so the, um, that you could make, uh, so that people have uh, given to this. Oh, th there, there's one more point be be before we continue discussing how wrong this is. Um, Notice that, uh, of course, uh, this prefers uh, the scalar field to be here, and also uh, it would give you the biggest value if the scalar field is here, right? So if it is at the minimum today, so if it has the cosmological constant today. So the biggest preference is to have the universe uh, be empty and have the cosmological constant it has today. So that's the extrapolation, finally, uh, that uh, for this potential, that, that, that would be the, High, most probable thing, okay? Um, now, you could say, well, maybe maybe when we talk about the universe today, uh, that's maybe more complicated, it might not be, uh, maybe there is some anthropic constraint that we, sh you know, we should be there and, um, but I, I, I think even, even thinking about the inflationary times, right, um, there is a problem. So that, that's why I phrased it in the context of inflation so that uh, we see that, which is a context in which we are computing the small fluctuations. And when we consider this overall curvature of the space, which you can view it as a large fluctuation in the curvature. I mean, remember we're computing curvature fluctuations, so it's not something qualitatively different. It's just a curvature fluctuation, which is, uh, you know, a large fluctuation makes the universe a sphere. Um, 
and we, we, are, we are getting this uh, very wrong answer by using essentially the same method that we are using to get the right answer for the small L modes. I, I should say that I'm pretty alone in thinking that uh, this is a problem. So most people think it's not a problem. But I, feel, I feel they have their head in the sand. I think uh, they, it is a problem now. So what, what are the uh, answers people give to this? Um, so um, so the, the answer one is uh, just this hartle hawking prescription that we had for calculating the, the, the wave function of the universe when the universe is S3 is just wrong. We, we should not use this uh, for some reason, okay? So hartle hawking is wrong. Um, and in some sense, uh, it's, it's wrong because already when we apply it to our own universe today, it prefers a universe which is empty. Um, so that, uh, on the other hand, this, uh, this type of calculation is correct for small fluctuations. I don't see it being qualitatively different. Uh, um, and as we will see, there is a somewhat similar prescription for doing computations in the ADS context, which uh, gives the, the correct answer. And so another, uh, so that's some, those are some reasons for thinking hartle hawking might be correct in some way. Um, so the answer too um, is that uh, we, um, we should not, so, so, so that we, we should really uh, think about the phase that happened before inflation um, and uh, not try to attempt to compute probabilities this way, but uh, think that before inflation there was some other phase uh, of, let's say, perhaps eternal inflation with bubble nucleations and so on, and that um, the initial conditions then for inflation come from this phase, and, um, and then uh, there was some tunneling event and so on, and, we, we never have a uh, say universe with positive curvature. We might even have a universe with negative curvature, as we discussed uh, previously. That's the type of universe you get from uh, bubble nucleation. So perhaps uh, that phase, uh, that previous phase of uh, eternal inflation, is what fixes this problem. So eternal inflation. Uh, so the whole eternal inflation picture. There was something that happened before. Uh, that we can't calculate with present methods, and that set up the initial conditions, and then we uh, we go from there onwards. So we put that as a as uh, something that really happened, and then we continue the calculation, and then then you never uh, you, you never calculate try to calculate the probability in this way. Um, so I, I think the second one is probably the more popular answer. Uh, most people will probably give you this answer. Um, now. I will now like to uh, do a calculation that um, also gives some kind of per some perspective on on this issue, um, which is a calculation originally done by Starobinsky. Um, it's a calculation in the context of slow roll eternal inflation. So the context here will be the following. So imagine that uh, we have a potential uh, V of phi. Um, which is uh, very slowly varying, okay? Um, and for the sake of the argument, we are going to be, have a potential that uh, is never zero, so there, are, there is some lower, lower minimum, but uh, it's uh, very slowly varying, so that we are always in the, let's say, regime of eternal inflation, okay? Um, then uh, what... Uh, Starobinsky said was the following. So let's imagine we try to calculate the uh, equation of motion for the scalar field. So Star Starobinsky said, well, let's follow a particular observer in that universe, so, and we'll try to see what that uh, observer kind of experiences, right? So, so we'll, we'll see that the field phi uh, is uh, going down by the slow roll equations, right, uh, d phi of b. Um, so this is just the classical evolution of the field. But in addition, we have quantum fluctuations. So we have the possibility of having quantum fluctuations. And w the idea, his idea was to think of the quantum fluctuations as a kind of random force. So random uh, time-dependent force, right? Um, so each time, and we imagine this evolution is over several leaf folds, right? 
So this uh, will decay, and then this will have some uh, some fluctuations. That for each unit of time, they are they are independent. So for each for, for each e-fold, you have an independent fluctuation. So it could go up or down, and so on. So this is a randomly varying uh, quantity, which uh, with a which has on, it's only correlated at equal times, but it's uncorrelated at different times. Okay, because so yeah. Um, okay, so and if you work out uh, how so we expect that the correlations be between of these uh, random additional terms that we have in phi dot um, should we expect that they should be uh, locally correlated in time, so it will be a delta function uh, correlated in time, and then uh, it should have some prefactor, and the prefactor is uh, chosen so as to give you the right spectrum of fluctuations, right, from th that we calculated before, and so you can uh, calculate what that uh, prefactor should be, and it turns out that it should be uh, h cubed over 2 pi squared. Okay. This this requires some calculation, but it's kind of plausible. It's uh, dimensionally correct. It involves only h, so the factor of h is clear. The two pi, so you would need to do a little bit of work. Um, okay, so now uh, now that you have this, uh, you realize that uh, this is similar uh, to the setup. That, so th this looks similar to a particle that is moving uh, with a random force. So you can think of f as a random force, which is uh, with a local noise, the noise that is uh, local in time, um, and evolving in this particular way. And so in, in these situations, there is uh, an equation that uh, tells you how the probability distribution varies. So if you have some initial probability distribution for, for phi, then um, due to this random force, it will go over to various uh, probability distributions that uh, depend on time. So there's an equation for this probability distribution that is called the Fokker-Planck equation. And uh, it has uh, the following form. Uh, so the d of rho equal. So there is a piece that comes uh, from the random force that uh, is proportional to, well, the coefficient of the random force. Um, times the second derivative of uh, the distribution, and then a piece that uh, comes from the classical force, uh, so which is d phi uh, b prime of rho. Okay. So that's uh, that's uh, that's the story. Um, and uh, well, we, we we could discuss uh, how is this is derived if we want. If we, we are not familiar with this, um, but. Uh, this is, uh, well, so somehow standard derivation of this. I mean, this is basically, uh, this basically comes from saying that, um, so for example, this term uh, comes from saying that the probability distribution at some later time is given by the probability distribution at, at an earlier time at a different value of phi, right? So, because phi will evolve from that time to the, the later time, that's, basically where this term comes from. And uh, this term comes from the fact that we had this random force, but you need to expand. Uh, well, it's the same logic, but you expand to second order in f, and then you average over f, and then you get uh, this expression. Anyway, so, so this is how the probability distribution uh, for observing the field phi as a function of time, right? So we have this uh, person moving in internally inflating in this way, there is some probability initial probability distribution for phi, and then this probability distribution starts evolving uh, you know, uh, in this, governed by this equation. Now, if uh, this uh, reaches some equilibrium where uh, the time derivative becomes zero, then let's try to see where, what this equilibrium uh, configuration is. So in that case, we can pick, we can take this uh, phi outside, so there is a, there is then something that goes like uh, h to the 4 uh, times d phi rho plus uh, v prime rho equal to 0, right? So we get uh, some equation roughly like this. Um, and uh, then it turns out that you can uh, integrate this equation and say that uh, rho will go like e to the 1 over b, okay? v of phi. 
and you can, uh, with all the coefficients uh, that were put in here, you can check that uh, the, the coefficient here is exactly the same as uh, the necessary one to say that this row is e to the the zeta entropy for uh, that value of phi. Okay, so the entropy corresponding to uh, a the zeta with this particular value of v. Okay, so this is um, this is a discussion which um, shows that the uh, just eternal inflation with this evolution. Uh, will lead to a probability distribution that is given by the hartle hawkin expression. Okay, so we got this hartle hawkin answer from a dynamical process. Okay, uh, but we got it only after equilibrium was established, right? So we established somehow some equilibrium, uh, some time in time independent uh, configuration, and then then uh, we had the hartle hawkin discussion. Okay. Is, is that clear? Or, um, now, yes. I don't know how to connect the two, so, uh, but m maybe there is a way to connect them. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so, um, um, okay. So I think, um, Okay, let's see what happens if we don't set it to zero. Um, um, so we uh, so we have we could have a constant here. Um, um, what um, I suspect you might get something non-normalized. So so then there will be another solution, right? Um, there will be a, a well. There there is this solution, and then there is a solution of the um, okay, I haven't thought about this, so I'll, I owe you that. Or maybe you, got, you can work it out. I suspect that, uh, it, that uh, for a potential that is like this, uh, it will give you something perhaps not normalizable. Um, now, um, yeah, so, yeah, no, notice that here uh, we picked a potential that doesn't go to zero. Um, so that the final distribution is normalizable, right? Um, and uh, if uh, this distribution, if that hadn't been the case, right? So if we had a potential uh, which maybe hits zero somewhere, uh, uh, or even goes below zero, then uh, we have a problem, okay? Then you would not uh, have something normalizable. Um, and maybe in those situations, uh, probably equilibrium will not be established, right? So we start uh, moving. So this uh, this type of, uh, okay, so that's uh, some observation. Now this, so you could take the point of view, and this is a point of view I heard uh, Linda say, uh, is that hartle hawking gives you the probability that you will end up in, let's say, the sitter space or that, they give you the probability distributions after equilibrium is established, uh, but not before. So somehow the idea is that uh, when we had this eternal inflation and even uh, throughout the universe now, we are outside the equilibrium. So that's why we don't have the hartle hawking distribution. But if we go very far into the future of our own universe, eventually maybe equilibrium will be established and then we'll, uh, probabilities will be given by the hartle hawking uh, distribution. Okay. Um, okay, very good. So the question is, uh, how do we calculate then, from that point of view, the question is, how do we calculate the probabilities to start somewhere, right? And here, uh, there is a discussion that, um, there is an observation that uh, I guess goes back to Vilenkin. Um, and this is the following. So. Imagine, so he considers the same, exactly the same setup as Hartle and Hawking, 
of uh, the expanding universe, for example. And uh, let's think uh, of the quantum mechanics for the scale factor A. Um, and that quantum mechanics has uh, some kinetic term and then some effective potential term. Uh, there, there are some other factors of A here that I'm not writing. Uh, but the point is that it looks like a quantum mechanics for one uh, degree of freedom. And there is a, an effective potential, so we can think about the effective potential as a function of A that uh, has a form roughly like this. So the, and uh, due to Hamiltonian constraint, we are selecting uh, energy equal to zero states uh, in this uh, quantum mechanics theory. And the standard, uh, the standard the Sitter solution corresponds to a solution where a particle comes in here and then gets reflected from this wall and then goes back out, right? That's the solution where, Lorentzian solution where the universe shrinks and then expands again, okay? And uh, the, the wave function that Hartle and Hawking compute is a wave function that decreases uh, here and then it increases exponentially in this forbidden region. So this is the allowed region of the quantum mechanics and this is the forbidden region below the barrier. Um, and then uh, when it reaches this point, it starts, uh, you know, oscillating. And uh, so this oscillating part is the Lorentzian solution. Um, that's uh, just the, the, the A moving up and down. Um, so that's uh, Hartle and Hawking. Now, Vilenkin said, well, I'm, I'm look at this picture and just, uh, it looks like a barrier uh, problem. Um, and he says, well, maybe the boundary conditions we should impose is that the universe started at A equal to zero. So we start with very tiny universe with A equal to zero in some regime that we can't really describe. And then, then we have some tunneling probability to tunnel uh, here through this barrier. And then this tunneling through the barrier will give you an exponentially small uh, correction. Um, it's basically a wave function which, uh, you know, is concentrated here and decays exponentially as you go in this direction. Um, and if you calculate the wave function the, or the probability in that way, uh, the probability will be, will have the opposite sign than the hartle hawking one, so it will be minus the entropy of the sitter, okay? And so it would prefer to create uh, universes with small cosmological constants. So this is a nicer, well, if this was correct, then this uh, would be a nicer uh, uh, result because it would tell you that you create a universe with a very tiny, let's say, cosmological constant, and then it inflates or it slides down a potential and so on. So it's uh, more reasonable, okay? I mean, it gives an answer that we like more, but uh, the question is, uh, but, but it involves a regime with, so the starting regime is some regime you don't, we don't really understand. So the universe with A equal to zero. Um, um, so it might, might be correct. This one other proposal that people uh, have, uh, have made for addressing this problem. Uh, the total energy goes to zero. So, so when you take uh, uh, general relativity and you uh, reduce it in, uh, you, you just consider the A variable, you truncate it to just one degree of freedom, which is the size degree of freedom. Uh, then you get this effective Lagrangian, but you, you originally had a time reparameterization symmetry. And that implies that you will have a constraint. And that constraint is uh, that the total energy will be zero. So we, we consider this quantum mechanics, but the only physical states are the ones with energy equal to zero. Um, Okay, um, very good. So we discussed some of these uh, confusions, let's say. Um, now let me uh, point out, so, uh, an, a Euclidean, a, an ADS context where a similar, very similar problem arises, very similar situation arises, but in that case it, it leads to no problem. Um, so now we'll uh, consider uh, ADS, so negative cosmological constant. And we'll consider the Euclidean ADS situation, so where we have Euclidean space. Um, and in this case, uh, we could uh, similarly consider universes with uh, particular three metrics. And then uh, we can then again fill them in in a completely smooth way with a Euclidean, uh, Euclidean signature uh, four-dimensional metric, so this is a metric, uh, 4D metric. 
um, that is now completely Euclidean, so nothing funny about complex uh, signatures and so on, uh, complex uh, metrics. Uh, we can typically find solutions like this. Uh, a simple example uh, with a boundary which is a, a S, an S3 would be the metric uh, d square equal to d rho square plus inch uh, square rho uh, d omega 3. Right? So this is uh, simply some metric that uh, fills the sphere in a smooth way. Okay. Um, and then in this case, we can also uh, compute the, the Euclidean action. Um, so the same problem. And uh, we, we, we can calculate e to the minus uh, the Euclidean action. So the usual uh, Euclidean action as a function of the boundary three metric. For the case of a round sphere, you can uh, calculate it and uh, you'll get some answer. And um, so the, the, these answers in this, in this ADS case, this is supposed to be the same as uh, the partition function or some approximation to the partition function that would be like the leading order approximation uh, to the partition function of a conformal field theory that is defined on that uh, same three manifold. Right? In particular, for the case of the S3, for the round S3, you can uh, take uh, concrete examples of ADS uh, CFT where you know both the uh, physics, the gravitational theory in the ADS space time and the quantum field theory on the boundary and you can calculate the S3 partition function independently and you get an answer that agrees with this prescription and this way of filling it in. So in other words, in the ADS context, uh, this analog of the hartle hawking prescription uh, works. Okay. It's amusing that in the hartle hawking paper, they, they say that uh, their prescription doesn't work for ADS. And now, uh, nowadays, it's the case that uh, we understand best. Uh, um, OK, now these two are, are intimately connected. So I, I now will discuss, uh, well, the uh, mathematical connection between uh, computations in ADS and DS. So the objective of this discussion is just to try to show the unity between these uh, two computations. Now, sometimes you think, well, you know, the sitter and anti the sitter are the opposite. They have opposite cosmological constants. They have very different physics, naively. But, uh, well, and they, they, they do for many purposes. Uh, but from the point of view of co cosmological correlators, they are uh, rather similar and rather closely related. And it's useful to have this relationship in mind because you can use ADS intuition or ADS formulas people have used before. Or, so it's, it's, it's useful because people have been studying ADS for quite a while. So uh, it's useful at least for that point of view. If you're only interested in the sitter, perhaps it's not very useful. But uh, so I want to explain that connection. Um, OK. So let's start uh, with the sitter space. So let's first uh, observe uh, the following uh, property. Um, so we have uh, the sitter metric, which is minus uh, d tau square plus uh, cosh uh, square tau uh, d omega 3. So this was the, the sitter metric. I wrote there uh, an ADS uh, form of the metric. Uh, I also remind you that uh, there was the Euclidean metric, which you get by tau equal to i theta, uh, where this is uh, d theta square plus sine square theta. Uh, the omega 3. So it's useful to think in terms of the, uh, so this is time, so this is the usual, uh, the sitter time, and this is the complex uh, time plane. So if we, at t equal to zero, we go into the Euclidean direction, and we go all the way to pi over two, right? So this segment here describes half of S4, so, okay? So this uh, segment here, the full S4 is described by this whole segment, OK? Um, now, the observation is that if you set tau, so in this, along this line, you could set tau equal to i pi over 2 plus uh, rho, OK? And if you set uh, tau equal to this, so what would happen? So i pi over 2, so we set here i pi over 2 plus rho, then this becomes minus uh, sin squared, OK? 
uh, this formula. And so we find that this metric becomes equal to minus uh, d rho squared plus sinh uh, square rho d omega 3 squared, right? So it's somehow minus the metric. So it's the same as the, the ADS metric up to an overall sign, okay? And the overall sign is, is, is good because um, uh, we need that for solving the, the, the so the Einstein equations with positive cosmological constant. So this metric obeys the Einstein equations with positive cosmological constant. Um, but if you reverse the sign of the metric, it's similar to the metric with, okay. Let me write this as uh, minus uh, G tilde, right? So G tilde is just the standard ADS metric, which uh, where, where we subtract this overall minus sign. Um, and then uh, if we had, uh, so if we have, for example, the, the Einstein action for the metric G minus, let's say, lambda of the sitter. Um, um, so an overall minus sign in this term, so this term scales like uh, one power of the metric, so we'll reverse the sign, so this will be, so that, that the action evaluated on this metric is the same as the, so this will get a minus sign in this term, uh, minus sign in this term, right? And this is the same as uh, an overall minus sign times uh, square root of gr, uh, now minus lambda of ADS, which has the opposite sign, right? So I, we define this to be minus the lambda of the sitter. Okay, so the, the action then evaluated on one is the same as the action evaluated on the other metric up to a sign. So this is uh, G tilde, sorry. So this is uh, on the metric G tilde. Okay, so up to the sign in the action, they are the same, so the questions of motion uh, are going to be related. Okay. So if you have, uh, if you started from the, the sitter metric, you make this little analytic continuation, uh, you get this minus metric, and the original metric without the minus sign obeys the Euclidean ADS conditions. So you can, so it's, it's not just a similarity, but it's actually a very precise uh, relationship between the two, okay? Um, and what that means is that uh, if you, um, so there are two problems we discussed. One was calculating the wave function uh, for ds. Let's say we have pure gravity for a certain three metric, right? So we can consider this problem, or we could consider the problem of calculating the partition function of a Euclidean CFT um, that involves e to the minus s, uh, well, uh, of ADS on some metric g tilde, um, so some particular metric g tilde equal to g3, let's say the same, the same function, right? And we can relate uh, these two computations uh, by, by this method. So if we had some geometry that solves, uh, that solves this problem, uh, then that uh, anal suitable analytic continuation of that geometry uh, will be a minus metric um, and Will, be a, will determine a metric G tilde, which uh, will solve this problem. And the two actions uh, will be related by minus sign. So uh, the, the exponential that we get here is minus the exponential that we get here, okay? So the two are uh, up to an, this overall minus sign, which of course doesn't change the equations of motion or anything. We, we, we get the same answer. Now let, let's, let, me, let me give you a specific example of how, how this relationship works. Um, so let's consider the problem of small fluctuations, right? Again, we go back to our uh, wave function for small fluctuations. We said a few times already that, uh, well, maybe I should ask you, what was the wave function for small fluctuations uh, in the sitter for small, let's say, metric fluctuations? Well, let, let, let's, let's first ask whether it has a minus sign or a plus sign. Well, let, let's first ask whether it's, uh, we have some small fluctuations gamma, um, which we expand, let's say, in Fourier modes. So for each Fourier mode, uh, what was the wave function? Um, th th this is the wave function for the sitter space at uh, late times. Yeah, there is a minus sign. Um, 
is some function of gamma k. Remember which function it was? What? Uh, is it uh, linear, quadratic, or? Yeah, quadratic. So it was a quadratic function, Gaussian function. And uh, do you remember what coefficient, what function of k we had here? Cube, yeah. It was the inverse that was, was appearing in the power spectrum. And if we continue, you remember the, the, the factor in front? Yeah, m squared over h. Okay, very good. So that's uh, the wave function for the sitter. And the minus sign is important for it to be normalizable, right? But that's what we got, and that's good. Now, for the case of if we did the same problem in ADS, we said that we find an answer which is the exact uh, opposite of this, so plus uh, m squared over h squared k cube over gamma cube. Um, so this is the this is supposed to be the same as a partition function um, of a CFT uh, on a background where we. Uh, deform the metric, so we add uh, some terms uh, proportional to the stress tensor, right? So, well, maybe I should say some metric which is delta ij plus gamma ij, um, and this is the same as the expectation value of and that CFT of gamma ij tij, where tij is the stress tensor of the CFT, okay? Now, this sign is also important for this interpretation. Uh, because uh, that sign uh, is related to the sign of the two-point function of the stress tensor. So the two-point function of the stress tensor is the second derivative uh, of that uh, expression with respect to gamma um, of that C evaluated at gamma equal to zero. And uh, that uh, is uh, going to give us this uh, K cube with a plus sign, okay? Um, and this plus sign in Fourier space implies that uh, when you work it out, it also implies that in position space, uh, this uh, correlator, well, by dimensional analysis, it goes like a power 1 over x to the 6. And by thinking about these Fourier transforms, you uh, find that a plus sign here corresponds to a plus sign here. Okay, So this requires a little calculation. Um, and now, in Euclidean space, the, the two-point functions uh, should be uh, reflection positive. Um, here I'm uh, being sloppy with the indices. So there are some indices here, but let's say we put the indices suitably equal. Um, and um, yeah, so if, if you have a unitary theory in Lorentzian three-dimensional space, and we continue it to Euclidean three-dimensional space, then that uh, two-point function should be uh, reflection positive. Re reflection positive is that if you pick uh, one plane and uh, you put two points at opposite points on this uh, uh, opposite sides of this plane, that two-point function should be positive. Because this uh, computation has the interpretation as evolving in Euclidean time up to here and then computing the norm uh, squared of uh, well, the product of this with itself um, or its bra. So then it should be positive. Um, very good. Um, now, why am I making a big deal of this sign? Well, oh, yeah. So, the, um, okay. Um, now, one question you can ask is uh, whether there is a DS CFD. Um, in the same way that there is an ADS CFT, could there be a DS CFT? So this is kind of a more formal question. So we, we've seen, okay, let, let me try to recap the logic. We, cal we did some calculations in, a in the, uh, the sitter. We calculated these cosmological correlators. We found that they are very similar to the ones uh, you have in ADS. And so now uh, is this, in the case of ADS, we knew that we know that those correlators uh, have all the properties you need uh, for a conformal field theory. So they, they could be the correlators of a conformal field theory. They have all the symmetries of a conformal field theory, et cetera. And in some specific cases, we can check that they are indeed uh, 
related to conformal field theory. Um, so the question is whether the same could be true for the sitter. Could it be true that uh, this wave function that we compute in the sitter as a function of the three geometry and the scalar field could be viewed as the partition function of some conformal field theory um, or deformed conformal field theory or some, let's say, quantum field theory um, on some uh, three metric and with some coupling that uh, is related to some space dependent coupling that is related to the scalar field. Okay. Um, so if we have the sitter without uh, the scalar field or the scalar field is zero, then it would be a CFT indeed. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, well, you, you get the idea. Should I explain that a little more clearly? Why it's a CFT versus a QFT? No? Explain? Yeah. Yeah, let, let, let me first uh, state the simplest case, simpler case. So let's say uh, we have a, just uh, the sitter space with uh, given values of the three metric and perhaps of a scalar field. Um, well, let me not put the scalar field yet. So just given values of the three metric. Uh, then the, the idea is that the de sitter wave function for that metric uh, should be equal to uh, the conformal field theory partition function of a CFT on a three-dimensional three space. So this is a three-dimensional CFT. This is a four-dimensional de sitter space. Um, and that CFT is evaluated on some background metric, which is given by this uh, three geometry that was appearing in the argument of this wave function. Okay. Um, so this uh, is a question. Uh, and if this were true, then it would allow us to calculate exactly what this wave function is. So non-perturbatively and blah, 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 and so on. Um, now, we, we think this is true for the ADS case in many cases, and there have been many checks of this. Um, and the question is whether it could be true here. And, well, th there were some arguments for or against. Th there are some arguments, some objections to this uh, relationship. Um, so let me, let me just try to say what the objections are. Um, uh, the, the, well, the, the short answer is that the objections are not relevant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the objections are not relevant to the possible validity of this, but uh, they are relevant to the possible usefulness of the relationship. Um, so um, there, there are two, two closely related objections. So one is that, uh, let's say, in a full theory of quantum gravity, such as string theory, we would expect the sitter to decay. And so, um, so we have some the sitter space, but then it will decay to other spaces. So the boundary in the future uh, that we expect uh, is we'll have that fractal structure that we discussed, and it would not be just the boundary, that nice, simple boundary that we have in uh, the sitter space. Okay, so this is objection number one. Uh, objection number two is that uh, we've seen that in the sitter space there are quantum fluctuations, right? And so the, the metric will have all kinds of quantum fluctuations, and as you approach the boundary, the metric will uh, fluctuate thermally, sort of similar to this Tarobinsky discussion. Um, and so we will not have a well-defined uh, metric in the far future. So these are uh, two objections. Um, but the, the, the two objections are, are, uh, are not relevant in, in the sense that the statement, if there was a statement, it would be a statement about the wave function evaluated for some particular three metric. So for example, we, we set a particular three metric, let's say the flat space metric, and that amounts to basically forbidding these uh, fluctuations in the future. So when we think about these fluctuations or, or also these decays, we are imagining uh, more physical boundary conditions where we don't fix uh, what will happen in the future. But a, a wave function um, is something where we uh, have the initial state of inflation, maybe the Hartle-Hawking state, and we are picking a particular out vacuum. It's similar to a scattering amplitude. It would be similar to an exclusive scattering amplitude where we fix some outgoing state. In this case, the outgoing state is the one with this particular three metric, and we're just calculating the amplitude for that particular state. Okay, That might be given by this uh, CFT. 
In particular, uh, if we have a three metric that is completely smooth, then we are forbidding all these decays, right? And so given that the decays are not happening, then we would expect that uh, we'll get uh, some suppression that is proportional to the decay rate times uh, the volume of the space, right? So this is the, the probability that the decay did not happen. So we are calculating uh, th that, that object. Is that clear? So it, is it clear what the objection was and how it's not relevant to the possible validity of the problem or not? Now, but, yes. Uh, well, you, you fix here uh, the boundary of ADS is just set by this metric. So you have some uh, three in the far future. So you're fixing future boundary conditions and you're calculating what? Yes, yes, yes. It's again the boundary. So it's, it's like uh, those pictures where we have some metric in the boundary in the future boundaries, a particular three metric. So the, the, the Citer universe goes to a particular three metric. We fix those boundary conditions and we are just asking what the, um, what the amplitude for that particular process is. Um, to, to go back to this picture, what we would need is to, we would need to integrate over metrics, right, uh, of this uh, wave function squared, right? And this will give us what the more typical metric is. It will allow us to calculate expectation values such as this type of expectation values that are involved in this discussion. Um, similarly, we could consider uh, metrics which contain, let's say, domain walls between different types of CFTs and so on. And those would start uh, discussing probabilities for this type of events, okay? Um, and then if we sum over all, all those possible things, uh, as in here, we could recover uh, this picture one. So in principle, we could recover these pictures from the other, uh, from this discussion, but it will require doing more calculations on different CFT uh, situations. So, so I, I, I view this question as unsettled of whether there is a CFT or not. Um, and uh, there, is, uh, there is one example of, uh, of a DSCFT for a very weird theory of gravity, which is the higher spin theory of gravity. Um, so it's unclear whether the, uh, well, whether, how well defined that, well, it's unclear whether that then will extend to a, an Einstein theory of gravity, which is what we really care about, where we only have spin two particles. So the higher spin theory of gravity has a graviton and then has uh, massless particles of all possible spins. Um, now, one important point is that uh, this CFT, if it exists, so it's defined in Euclidean space, but it's not a reflection positive CFT. So it's not the analytic continuation of a Lorentzian CFT. So it's a weird kind of CFT that we are not uh, maybe completely used to. Uh, and it has to be that way in order for, so the stress tensor two point function of that CFT uh, due to that form of the wave function would have the opposite sign, the opposite sign that it has in more ordinary CFTs, okay? So that shows it's not a standard, it's not the analytic continuation of a unitary CFT. Um, but it's also not a completely random CFT presumably because the, it should have some special properties in order for, uh, in order to generate a time evolution, an extra dimension, which is the time direction, uh, in which the theory, the bulk theory is unitary along the time direction. And that probably puts some constraint on the CFT, which uh, people are, are kind of exploring which constraints those are. Now this is a possible duality between um, the sitter and uh, CFT. Uh, of course, if we have inflation, something like inflation, inflationary universe, uh, then uh, you would have to fix, uh, it would be a QFT that uh, has an additional coupling, it's not a CFT. Uh, and then that coupling could be time dependent, could be space dependent, um, and, uh, and that's some additional data, right? Um, okay, so this is one uh, possible, perhaps non-perturbative definition of uh, these things. Unfortunately, we don't know any example. And there is another one that people have uh, discussed or have speculated about, which is in the context of um, the static patch, right? So let me uh, review a few things about the static patch of the sitter. So we can consider 
uh, just physics from the point of view of a static observer here. Um, and then uh, we focus on this region outside the cosmological horizon. And we could say, well, maybe we can forget about what everything that is behind the, um, the Sitter horizon the same way that when we think about black holes, we can, let's say, replace everything that is behind the black hole horizon by a system with a finite number of, with a Hilbert space whose uh, dimension um, is equal to e to the s, okay? Where s is the, the Sitter entropy. So for black holes, uh, we make a hypothesis like this and it, it seems to work in uh, many cases. Well, in, but there are some specific, well, if, if you believe in ADS-CFT, then it does work. Um, but um, the question is whether we could work here in the static patch discussion. So that all the physics of uh, any observation in the static patch done by, by an observer that's moving here can be reproduced by some observation on this Hilbert space with uh, finite dimensions, right? Finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so again, we don't have a concrete example of how this, of, of you know, some quantum mechanical theory that has this property, or a Hilbert space with, that is dual to some Einstein theory. But the fact that we don't have any examples does not mean that this could not be true. Um, okay, so one interesting thing is that um, uh, the, if you put any excitation in the static patch, so let's say a particle of mass m, okay, um, then uh, this, this reduces the area of the cosmological horizon. Um, you can find uh, exact solutions, for example, of a black hole of mass little m, uh, of mass m, and there is a black hole horizon and now a cosmological horizon. Um, and when you calculate uh, the, the entropy of this configuration by taking the sum of these two areas, you find that uh, the entropy, at least when the mass is not too large, is, uh, it gets reduced and is basically the, the original De Sitter entropy uh, minus uh, m over t. Okay? So it gets reduced in a way that uh, uh, is such that the new entropy is equal to this factor that looks like a thermal looking factor, right? That's related to, to the De Sitter temperature. So this is something that, um, well, first of all, you can uh, explicitly calculate by looking at the Schwarzschild de Sitter uh, solution, black hole solution. Um, and then it's consistent with the idea that uh, you have some uh, theory in the microcanonical ensemble um, where, um, w w where there is some diseffective temperature T, but we have the state of maximal entropy. And as we, um, we gather some energy, we, we take energy out of the cosmological horizon to produce this object of mass m, uh, then uh, we reduce the number of states in this way. So this is uh, an interpretation of, uh, of, of things. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, any object that we have here will tend to dissipate and decay and go back to the, the Sitter horizon. So excitations that we produce here at the center tend to fall into the in, into the black hole horizon and give back the sitter back in the future. Right? This is uh, consistent with the idea that in the far future, that we'll go back to the state with maximal entropy, which will be the state with an empty universe. In, uh, if the theory had a potential and uh, this the sitter is the absolute minimum of the potential, then we excite uh, you know, the, the potential at some higher value, then that will again have lower entropy and then it will go back to the maximal entropy of the Sitter space. Um, so that uh, might be the, the description, perhaps the ultimate description of our universe, might be the, some theory on uh, you know, the static patch of uh, the, the Sitter space that will uh, with the current cosmological constant. Um, and uh, yeah, so from that point of view, it's a bit of a mystery why we started in the inflationary situation because uh, that's, that will look like a very unlikely uh, starting point. In fact, uh, some of the people who object to inflation, they object on those grounds that, well, it looks like a, it looks like a very unlikely initial point. So, um, but well, this is not very different from uh, other theories of physics. Usually we, 
uh, we, we always start in unlikely points and then we go to more likely things. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and yeah, we hope that uh, ultimately we'll understand why this is the case. Uh, but uh, inflation, so standard slow roll inflation is uh, not any different than any other theory of physics where we start from some special initial conditions and then we evolve in a natural way to, to more complicated uh, conditions. Okay, so that's all I had to tell you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yes, yes, that uh, is... Uh, uh, Maloney, Strominger, and I think Hartman. Uh, I'm not sure about the third person. Maybe Aninos, maybe it was Aninos. Uh, Do you have a question as to why it is that? I don't remember, but uh, you know, it might, be it might have Vasiliev theory in the title. The hair spin theory is called Vasiliev theory. Um, if, uh, if you meet me later, I'll just find it and send it to you. I'll find it in my phone and send it. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so the, the logic for this is similar to the logic for, so this is inspired uh, with the black, black holes. So if you have, so let, let me remind you of uh, the black hole situation. So uh, there you have a black hole, you have a black hole horizon, and you're looking at the black hole from outside, right? And you say, well, I can replace this whole geometry of whatever is behind the black hole, and even the, the well, for, if we am only interested in the, the in experiments that I do outside the black hole, uh, then I can replace this whole black hole and its environments uh, by a system that has some Hilbert space with some dimension uh, roughly of the form e to the s black hole, right? Um, so that's, that's an assumption that uh, well was made long ago and, uh, and now with uh, you know, ADS, CFT and so on, we think it's, uh, uh, it's correct. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I didn't finish the <laughs> analogy yet. <laughs> so here, here uh, we're in a similar situation. We have the static patch observer, and this this person is surrounded by a horizon, right? It's like uh, it's roughly similar. Imagine the black hole was in a box, right? There was a wall of the box here at the very end, and so then everything uh, in here can be replaced by some Hilbert space. Um, and so this is somewhat similar, except that instead of having the wall of the box, we have just r equal to zero. So the space just ends there, and we have uh, the rest of the, well, the, the rest of the space. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's a similar, similar idea. Uh, well, we, 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 we could draw some objections, but, but let me not. Um, Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So, uh, uh, so this is this best explains the Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think the most exciting, uh, well, from my point of view, the most exciting possible observation would be observing gravity waves. So, observing that uh, this R tensor to scalar ratio is non zero. So up to now, there are only upper bounds on R. So we, we discussed the constraints of cosmological parameters. So we had, uh, basically, there were three parameters, the amplitude of the scalar fluctuations, uh, then the, the running of the spectral fluctuations, of the scalar fluctuations. Those are two things that have been measured to be, well, some values. And then the one that is missing is the amplitude of the tensor fluctuations. And if we have those uh, three, then we have both the amplitude and epsilon and eta, so the, the three parameters that were appearing in the discussion. 
so far, uh, the, um, the, the gravity waves have not been seen, but, but they could be seen any time. Uh, in fact, there was a, an announcement a few years ago that they were seen, and uh, unfortunately it was wrong, but uh, that kind of shows that, uh, well, it, my, my mind it shows that it can happen at any time. The next time maybe it's correct, so they might see it, and uh, there could be a correct announcement at any time. Uh, And that would be very exciting because uh, first it would uh, fix the overall scale of inflation, H, to be fairly high, 10 to the 13th, 10 to the 12 GV, uh, if, it, if they are observed. Um, and uh, second, it would show that you know, gravity is quantum. Well, I mean, it's, well, at least it would be a strong indication. And it, it would be basically a smoking gun of inflation. It would be really, I, I would consider this to be a proof of inflation uh, to, to the extent that we can have a proof. Now people would say, well, not quite the proof, and I agree, but uh, it's as close as we could get in the near future to a proof of inflation. It, it would be ha much harder to object to inflation uh, after measuring the gravity waves. Um, yeah. Now the obstruction is just the two-point function of the stress tensor has the wrong sign. And that sign is important because in order to have a normalizable wave function. So, so it, it, it's uh, completely solid. It, it has to be this way. Yeah. Maybe I should say a few words about the example that we know. Um, and uh, so the example that we know is based on an, a similar ADS example. Um, that looks a very looks somewhat silly at first. So the the boundary CFT is just the in the ADS case is just the n uh, free fields. Uh, n free fields, but uh, we only consider uh, SON invariant uh, operators. So from n free fields, you can construct operators of the form phi squared. Uh, then phi, let's say the field is real, so phi i, phi i, um, phi i, d mu, d nu, phi i with these various derivatives. So that's the stress tensor of the field, d mu nu, and so on. So in this, you, you can, uh, in general, you have uh, d to the 2l, 2n, so, sorry, d to the 2n, uh, phi i, so some uh, operator with n indices, mu 1, mu 2 n indices, so even spins. So we have all operators with even spins, 0, 2, 4, etc. So these are the operators in the boundary theory, and the idea is that uh, so that lives at the boundary, and then in the bulk uh, we have a bunch of fields uh, with uh, even spins, so spins which are even. And um, the two-point functions or three-point functions are just given by the two or three-point functions in this uh, free theory. So the, the theory on the boundary is free, but uh, in the interior, uh, you have a non-trivial, for example, three-point function, because the three-point function of uh, operators, for example, three, three operators like this, they will lead to a diagram in terms of free fields where you contract the fields in this way, so it will be a non-trivial three-point function. So from the point of view of the bulk, there is some interaction. Um, and the, the bulk coupling constant, so this will be suppressed by powers of 1 over n, and so in, uh, this, in this bulk theory there is something analogous to G Newton, some coupling which is of order 1, uh, of order, uh, you know, one over n. Um, so that's, uh, that's the theory. Um, so that this is the boundary theory, and the bulk theory is supposed to be, well, uh, whatever you get by considering all possible uh, boundary correlators uh, that are single trace. And th there was a bulk theory that was previously written by Vasiliev, uh, which was this uh, theory that contained uh, a bunch of uh, higher spin fields. So this is in the bulk now. So there is some spill with some field of spin zero, some metric field, some I know some field with uh, B with many four indices, etc. With many many. And so some, he wrote the equations of motion for a theory with all these uh, fields. And uh, people have checked, uh, well, there, there are some checks that 
the two give the same answer. And these checks basically follow from the fact that the two theories have the same symmetry, some kind of higher spin uh, symmetry. Okay, so that was the case for that with an ADS4 dual. Uh, so this is ADS4 and this funny uh, gravity theory. Um, the idea for the idea for a DS uh, case is uh, based on this observation that we made that DS and ADS only differ by a sign. So if we just uh, switched uh, the appropriate sign in all these correlators, then we would get the right answer. And one way to uh, switch the signs is that instead of making the instead of having a bosonic field, uh, instead of having a commuting field, we have an anti-commuting field. So S, uh, let's say J. So S is uh, a spin zero. So uh, spin, so J equal to zero, uh, scalar field, but that is anti-commuting. So a ghost, ghost-like field. Okay. Um, so uh, and so if you if you do if you do that change, then uh, you find that uh, wherever you had ends before, now you have minus ends. Okay. Um, so the the theory. The theory with n anti-commuting fields, um, a large n will give you the same thing as the theory with uh, the ordinary fields, but with the opposite sign of n. Okay, and so that's uh, one way. And, and changing the sign of n is changing the overall coefficient in the action, and that's what we wanted to go from ADS to DS computations. So that's that's how this uh, this uh, idea was inspired. But well, it, it's uh, because it's just a simple analytic continuation. It's unclear what uh, whether it's just a consequence of the of this general analytic continuation, and this is just maybe a coincidence, or whether this is really uh, one example out of uh, many more that could exist. Uh, I, I should say that in general, it's, it's difficult to find ads CFT examples. So it, uh, we, we were lucky in the ADS case that. There are some supersymmetric theories that you can analyze, and you can see that they have ADS duals because they have supersymmetries highly constraining, and so on. Um, uh, however, um, in the in the DS case, we cannot have supersymmetry, so we don't have this tool that was useful for the ADS case. And it might be that that's the reason we are not finding examples. It might be, but so that's maybe one way to. Uh, justify the non-existence of examples, um, but I, I, I feel there is something worse in the sense that we do not what we do not know what kind of uh, field theory should be, or what kind of CFT should be. So when we say non-unitary CFT or non-reflect, it's a very big class, and there is probably they are probably constrained in some way that we haven't uh, fully understood. I, I, I doubt you could have some random uh, non-unitary CFT. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this an, this argument about analytic continuation works nicely for the wave function. Uh, it does not, so if you consider correlations which are expectation values or correlations in the bulk of uh, the sitter, that's more complicated. Uh, but in, in principle, they could be extracted from the boundary uh, wave function. So, uh, But yeah, so the, the fact that in the bulk you have this analytic continuation does not obviously mean that on the boundary you have some simple procedure from taking an ADS example and turning it into ADS example. In, in fact, uh, in theories like uh, string theory, you, it's quite difficult to find DS solutions, so the sitter solutions. Uh, it's relatively simple to find the ADS solutions, but uh, in order to find the, the sitter solution, you have to have some more complicated internal manifold, and you have to have various contributions to the energy, that they should all balance each other. And it's even discussed. Some people doubt that there is, exists even any construction of uh, the sitter space in string theory. Um, I, I'm not one, I'm not that kind. I think there, there are pretty good examples, but uh, just to show how uh, 
unsettled the, the question is. Gravity waves, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess it, it it will set the scale of inflation. So, uh, in, in string theory, the simplest uh, inflationary models we had were relatively low scale, where um, the, um, the, the were that produced unobservably small gravity waves, um, uh, but so we would have to understand why we had, uh, well, we, 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 it would point us to models, but it would tell us that we should make models with, with high scale. Um, well, they are not the models, let's say, I worked on, uh, they, they <laughs> which I consider to be the simplest models. <laughs> but uh, they, they are models that, for example, Eva Silverstein worked on um, and collaborators. Uh, of, like, her objective was to generate precisely models with high scale inflation. They, they have some more moving parts. I'm not completely convinced that they exist, uh, but uh, yeah, it will point us definitely towards those models. No, not 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 minimal, but they were let's say not the first that were made. Uh, in that sense, they were not the simplest. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean they they are not infinitely complicated. There, there are some models that people have uh, that, for example, Eva has uh, proposed over many years. So. It would definitely point us to, to those models, and, and and it will give you less space somehow to to construct models, uh, because it will it will set a high energy scale, right? So you have to do everything between the Planck scale and that scale. And I mean, not not only for string theory, but for any theory that that you, you will constrain you in this this way. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting question. Um, oh, the Transplankian BEV, sorry. Um, um, yes, yes. So this is, this is a question about the Transplankian BEVs for the fields. Um, yeah, again, this is a this is a this is not a problem from the effective field theory point of view, but it's a problem from the string theory point of view in the sense that you have to work to get a potential that is flat enough uh, for those uh, large BEVs. Um, there are models that have been claimed to have this uh, large transplankian BEVs, again by Eva. Uh, they are based on this idea of axion monodromy, if you've heard about it. Um, but yeah, so they, they require, they're a little more difficult to, to get than the model with smaller BEVs. Because you have to assume, you, you have to make sure that the potential remains constant uh, over this. So, so uh, roughly speaking, a large field range means that the geometry is somehow deforming a lot. There is something changing a lot in the geometry, and um, and the vacuum energy has to remain constant, almost constant. Um, so it's a, a little, yeah. I mean, Eva considers it completely established. I, I don't, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, yes, 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 yes. That, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a simple case, and yeah, but yeah. Now, now as R becomes smaller, you we, we are in the regime of uh, n. So it's phi to the n with n less than one, or <laughs> even less than some number less than one. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, it will be. I think it will be very. It will be very exciting if it is detected, but at the very least, we'll we'll have a much uh, stronger constraint as we, uh, uh, well, in ten years or so. There is one, maybe one comment is that. Um, it, it, one, one could speculate that perhaps in quantum gravity there is a constraint on R or on field range or um, that it cannot be too high perhaps. Uh, 
And it would be if there was a constraint, it would be nice to derive it before the measurement is done. <laughs> <laughs> because after they don't find R, and then, then we say, oh, no, but my theory of quantum gravity predicts that there wasn't an R. But it, it, would, be, it would be much more believable if you made this prediction before it. <laughs> R should be smaller than something. So let, let, let's say that uh, I, well, there is some bound on R. I, well, epsilon, I quoted 10 to the minus 3. So let's say epsilon should be less than 10 to the minus 5. Let's say quantum gravity implies epsilon 10 to the, This is a falsifiable prediction. <laughs> but if, if, we, if, if, if the you know, experiments are improved, and you know, we have now epsilon is less than 10 to the minus 5, and then I come with some prediction, oh, my theory of quantum gravity predicts it should be less than 10 to the minus 5, would be less believable. Um, again, some people believe that there isn't such a constraint. So like Eva, for example, does not think, uh, disagrees strongly with what I just said. Yeah, thank you.